So as, as uh, Monica Hava said, my background is quantum physics and I'm, I'm <clears throat> doing research along the lines of last year's Nobel Prize. And everything I tell you today is uh, my completely personal point of view and, and not supported at all by any philosophical or pedagogical framework. And <clears throat> it all came up, <clears throat> sorry, in a, in a kind of feeling in my lectures that something's missing. And I try to cast these feelings into words in the first part of my talk I try to explain you why do I think some kind of response system and lecture system needed. Then I'll give you an introduction to that. I'll uh, show you several perspectives and uh, you might want to take also the perspective of a student in all respects. And I'll show you a little bit what the system can do. And in the last part, I will show you how I use it and how the students like it or not. <clears throat> Before I start, let me set the scene a little bit where I use it in my lectures. So I, recently I was teaching two lectures, atomic physics for third year students, um, but my main part will be um, uh, introductory quantum physics where I use this now regularly. It's for second year students and I have on average 30, uh, 70 participants. Uh, these lectures are 90 minutes each, two lectures a week, and they're complemented by experimental demonstrations during the lectures. And additionally, the students have to solve problem sets so they are supposed to learn something also by doing problems. And this will be another part of, of another question that could arise. Why have additional questions during lectures? Well, <clears throat> first part of my feelings. What, what is a good lecture supposed to do? And that's, as I said, completely, uh, completely personal. And the first thing that I realized is um, if you want to, to approach students, you should know what's the level, what their level is. And especially in atomic physics, every student comes with a certain picture of what an atom is. I, I'm sure you have all have an idea of what an atom is. Depending on how far you went into your education in physics, it's little balls flying around or it's, it might be in quantum physics waves. And you have to know what the students think an atom is and then you can teach them what might be right or wrong in this picture. The second thing that I understood is you have to check the learning pro uh, progress. And the reason is if you don't and students don't understand something, you just cement the strong uh, understanding or you lose the students completely. The next thing, especially in physics, is you have to convey some kind of transfer capabilities. In physics, we have a mathematical framework, but at some point you have to step back and you have to attach this framework, this mathematics, to nature. You have to show people it's really physics that's happening in nature and not only something that, that's happening on a piece of paper. And so I all my feeling was this has to happen regularly and, and directly in lectures. Another thing is you have to motivate students. In the most gross case, you have to prevent them from falling asleep. Um, but also you have at some point to, to evoke this, this uh, maybe um, very fundamental feeling of having fun. Right? Without knowing I needed to earn much money, they just have to have fun. And the question is how to, so you have to find a way to, to uh, wake this up in students. Then you have to create an active learning environment, and that means students want to participate. They are, in first play, uh, case, they are motivated when they come to your lecture, so you have to somehow create an uh, environment where they want to participate. And then sometimes there are very minor things that prevent them from learning. For example, not enough books in the library, air conditioning somewhere is not working, all these things, and if you don't ask them, they don't dare to tell you. And so there are a lot of things that I thought you have to keep in mind. And the biggest question for me was, how do I know the status? How do I know what students think? And one answer could be, just ask them. So why, why don't I just ask? And I'm sure if I would ask you a question here, nobody would raise his hand. And the, the reasons are manifold. First thing is, if you have a class of, let's say, 200, 300 students, of course, not every student can respond. There are just too many. Some students or many students are shy, so they don't respond in the first place. Then if you ask a physics question, they're afraid that they don't know the answer, that they say something wrong, so they don't raise their hand. Another thing is good students, they don't want to answer the simple questions. And if there is a hard question, they want to show off. And I had several discussions in class which were completely killed by some student just raising up some, some well, not obvious uh, uh, relation to general relativity or something. 
And immediately all the other students, they would not participate anymore. And the next thing is, if I ask a question, <clears throat> the students might think I'm not asking just a question, I just make a statement. If I ask you, do you know, I don't know, some effect, then students think, if you don't know it, you're stupid, or whatever. I just sometimes just want to know, do you know it or not? If you don't, I explain it. If you know, I just go on. So the, my explanation is, information and communication are not independent from the person or the situation, and that sometimes obstructs communication in the classroom. And so for me, it was clear two things has to happen. The first is, in principle, all students should be able to communicate, to participate. And the response should be anonymous, so that nobody has to be afraid that they somehow do something wrong. And you all know there are these clicker systems that are sometimes available in class, sometimes not. In our case, it was not. And so the idea was, why don't we use something that is available everywhere for students? In fact, my students have their smartphone on the table all the time. And so the idea was, use existing mobile phones, the tablets or notebooks for some online response system. And I want you to show how it works, <clears throat> and I want to show you also how students feel, because let me let me tell you we're in class, and I just say there is a very fundamental law in physics that you all should know immediately. Oops, you know, should know, and that's Newton's second law of motion. And if I asked you now, do you know Newton's second law of motion? You would think, ah, oh, he's doing it again. He is asking a question, and maybe he even now picks somebody and asks him, and he could say something wrong. And these are all the feelings why students now would not dare to really respond. And if I start like this, my students already know they have to get out their smartphone. Because if you now take a picture of this QR code, or go online here on this website and enter this number, then I prepared a little survey and you're all invited to do this now. It's, it's uh, simple, it's anonymous, you don't lose anything. And you can test how it works. And I'll show everybody who has no smartphone available in a second how it works. And usually my students now know there are a few questions. They have a few minutes to talk to each other, to discuss the physics, and then we look at the results. If somebody needs it. Uh, I, I usually also hand out my smartphone. If somebody needs it, but I see everybody is more or less equipped. I hope it works. You should see <clears throat> two questions. One question regarding your affiliation. That's just an example of how I, I know the status of, of whom I'm talking to or whom I'm talking to. And the other is indeed the question to identify Newton's second law of motion. And I'm sure somebody know, somebody don't. And I'm not interested in who knows what. I'm just interested about the status. So is it working? <clears throat> is it, it's not working. Why not? So I'll, I'll come to the point where, where I say the flaws of technolo uh, technology. So I have, uh, I have one answer already, but not more. So in, in the last rows, it might be that the QR code is not uh, readable. It's a good motivation to uh, bring students to the front. But, but they, they all have bookmarked now the, this website. Pardon? The link doesn't work. Uh, yes, so there are more, but uh, I can. So these are all the problems that you have in the first lectures, and once the students are used to them, it works better.
I mean, um, everybody who has done the survey gets the results. I just uh, continue and show you if you don't, did not uh, uh, access this, how it looks. So you're guided to some website where you're uh, supposed to enter the identifier, the number of the session. I'll tell you later on about the structure of the system. And once you click to unmail them, then you'll be guided to the questions. And here in this system at the moment, yeah, there are questions, the number can be chosen. Every question uh, complemented by four possible answers, you can check exactly one. And once you're finished, then you can send your data and you're guided to the results page. And this just counts the number of every vote. And in this case, at the moment, we have two people from University of Luxembourg, two people from University of South Britain so far, three people, University of Kaiserslautern, one from another. And uh, well, then the most interesting question, uh, identify Newton's second law of motion. And uh, you see here already the correct answer is Ma uh, forces mass times acceleration, that's the correct answer. And here you're able to also display a little explanation why the others are not correct. All right, that was the situation a student is usually in. Let me tell you a little bit on the structure of this uh, tool. So it's in principle able to support several teachers, several uh, uh, professors, and every professor can have several courses. And in, within every course, for example, in this case, quantum physics, you can have a session for every lecture you give, and every session is identified by either a QR code or a number. Then you can pose your question, and next time you can have another session, another session and support for every lecture you give. And if you, at the same time, are teaching another course, then you have an independent course here where you again have different sessions and different questions. And this can be supported by several teachers. So in principle, that's a tool that can be used by a whole department. So that's the, the teacher's point of view. Here you have your list of courses. I just go very briefly through this to show you the capabilities. You have here, which is, I found a very nice feature, all your sessions that you can access later on. So you can block the access for the students, but you still can see which answers you ask and which, uh, which, which questions you ask and which answers the students gave. And you can look it up again. For every session that you choose, you have here a, um, a website where you can enter a new question with the possible answers. You can choose if the answer, the correct answer is displayed or not, and if it's active, this question or not. And you see all the already existing questions for the session to, to see if, you, uh, which, if your question fits into the series of questions. So that's the standard tool that, that I use. I'll show you in a second how it works. But that's all just triggered response from the students, right? I ask a question and then they have the chance to answer. But I note, especially in physics lectures, there is a point when I notice they just look at me at, at the slides, but they're not present anymore. And so most students don't dare to, um, to really raise their hand and say, sorry, I'm completely lost. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because again, they, they're afraid, in my opinion, that they don't uh, I get, I get a bad picture of them. And so I've implemented here something which I call the panic button. And this panic button, they can press just before they have the feeling they're completely lost. And then if there's for a certain, uh, for a certain lecture a threshold reached, then I get on my iPad a little notification. And then I know 10% or 20% or whatever I choose of the students, they just cannot follow anymore. And I had a very interesting experience with this. Students use it exactly once in the first lecture to try. And after that, I have the feeling they think it's stupid to press this button. And I really had for the first time the situation that students raised their hands and said, sorry, I don't understand what you're saying there. So that was maybe the best, uh, the best result from this tool. Let me tell you a little bit how I use it in my lectures. So I use between no and two surveys in each lecture, and, and that depends a little bit on the number of experimental demonstrations because I don't have unlimited time. So if I have lots of experiments to show, I don't do a survey. If I have no experiments, then I use more surveys. And the questions I pose, they concern either the basic knowledge of the students, so I want to see what they know from school, from the previous lectures. I want to see what they took over from the last lecture, 
what they really understood, what they can apply. I want to see if they can transfer the knowledge that we have derived in, in uh, lectures on, on the blackboard, if they can transfer this to experiments that I show. And I have a few, a few questions as examples if we have the time in the end to look at them. But I really show them an experiment and say in a question, so how, what do you expect now to see? And then sometimes I want to see knowledge transfer to the next topic where I tell them next lecture we will do a certain topic, please read it. And then I'll start with a, a question and see what they really understood so far. Then we do the lectures and I see what they have learned in the lecture. And finally, sometimes I ask about the learning conditions. Are there enough books in the lab, uh, in, in the, the library? Um, are there problems in the pro problem sets? Um, and all these little questions. And in my last lecture, I did approximately 20 surveys and 25 lectures. And one of these surveys, of course, was the question, how did the students like it? And I asked a few questions. And the first one, what do you think about the surveys during the lectures? And you see, in, in total, there are approximately 40 answers. And the reason is not all the students have a mobile device with them, and they can use it together. But the vast majority says idea and realization are good. Some say the idea is good, but the realization has to improve. And I agree. And I'll tell you a few things that we, are, we want to improve. And one answer, which I would have never gotten if I just asked directly, is somebody says communication during lectures is unnecessary. I mean, there are people who say, I don't care, but at least I get a real honest answer here. Another question, which I thought was very important, is how important is anonymity for you? And indeed, most say, and not most, but many say, very important, I would not contribute without. Many say, I might participate, but only if I'm absolutely sure that I have the correct answer. And some say, and that was interesting result for me, unimportant, I would also participate if I'm asked directly. And there are 10 students saying this, and I can assure you, I tried, with very simple answers, and as you can expect, I got not a single answer in the lecture. I mean, that, okay, there I think they were more brave when pressing the button than they were when, when I asked the question. But it shows to me, at least these votes, that most students appreciate that it's an anonymous uh, survey. And I just wanted to ask again what they think about asking questions at all in lectures, one of problem set. And uh, the most, most students said they're good, they learn something, and they enjoy participating. And some say, you see, they could also be moved to the problem set. And again, I got some honest answers. Some really say, I want to listen to you, listen during lectures and don't learn much by answering the questions. At least that was honest. All right. As you have seen, there are some possible issues, technical issues. And one thing we encountered is wireless is not always available, even in lecture halls with problems. I noticed some students, not all students have a mobile device. Many have, not all do. So at the moment, they share their mobile device. We have also, I have a colleague who's doing mobile phone physics, and they have a pool of devices that I can ask for and then distribute. But that might not be a solution for everybody. I realized for small groups, this tool is not well suited. I mean, if you have a lecture with or a seminar with four or five people, then it's just ridiculous to start an anonymous survey, and then communication goes up naturally. And the same for two large groups who have no experience of the server capacity might be sufficient, but we intend to um, try. So let me give you an, a little outlook. So I'm enough experimentalist to say if a tool doesn't work, I just get rid of it. And if it works, I improve it. And in this case, I think it works very well. And we tend to improve it. And the first thing is we want to adopt some graphic display for the result page to see graphically just what's going on. Um, in the uh, construction of the questions, we want to make some improvements, like choose the number of answers which are correct um, that the students can press or that I can offer them. Um, we want to develop a dedicated app and distinguish, for example, notebook by, by mobile phone devices and so forth. Most of all, I want to get more experience. And not, I want to get more experience, so we're trying to now establish this also in the department and distribute this to interested colleagues. So that's what I wanted to show you. My conclusion is I like this tool, not only because we developed it, but because I think it's successful. I want to improve it. 
And uh, I'm happy to get some uh, feedback from you, some improvements, some suggestions. Maybe you got inspired and then have some questions. And if you like, and there is time left, I have some example surveys, but these are physics related and maybe not interested for everybody. So thanks for your attention.